So today we're going to learn how to solve a very limited class of differential equations. Again, although the class is limited, we're ultimately building up to fixed point analysis that we'll be able to use on a nonlinear system. So um, we are going somewhere with this. We have a destination in mind. And we'll state our goal to solve a differential equation that looks like that. So linear, second order, homogeneous, and constant coefficients. Instead of functions that vary, we have constants A, B, C, and D. And I mean, I guess if I just gave you the answer, we could be out of here in 10 minutes, but we'll try to see where these answers come from. Let's try letting y equals e to the rx. Let's see if we can make that be a solution. And this always drove me crazy in undergraduate calculus, undergraduate differential equations, I mean, when I took this course, because what the professors always say and what the textbooks always say is, well, we guess a solution. We guess that e to the rx is a solution. And it feels like, what do you mean you guess? How can you just be guessing solutions. Well, we're not just guessing at random here. Our motivation is that if we have a first order linear differential equation with constant coefficients, then the solution is of this form. So we're saying, all right, we can solve first order differential equations and the solution is exponential. So maybe we can solve second order differential equations also using exponential solution. So we're not just floating around in the dark here. To see if we can make this a solution, we'll put it, its first derivative and its second derivative into that equation, and we'll see what happens. And I am going to wave my hands a little through the count through the, the nitty gritty. I mean, if y equals e to the rx, then y prime equals e to the equals r e to the rx. Y double prime equals r squared e to the rx. I feel like every time I say I'll go through something very quickly, it's a prelude to me actually giving all of the details. Um, when we take that y, that y prime, and that y double prime, and we plug it into this equation, we get a r squared e to the rx plus b r e to the rx plus c 
e to the rx equals zero. And this is something that maybe looks intimidating. Like if I told my college algebra class to solve this, they might uh, they might look at me kind of pitifully. But actually, this is pretty easy to solve because e to the rx is showing up in all of those terms, and we can just divide it away. And what we are then left with is a quadratic. AR squared plus BR plus C equals zero. So, A Y double prime plus B Y prime plus C Y equals zero has a solution E to the R X if and only if. A R squared plus B R plus C equals zero. So finding solutions to this differential equation, at least in part, is just root finding with the quadratic form to the or factoring or whatever. Um, if we have this differential equation, a x squared plus b x plus c is called the totally blanking. Okay, there we go. It's a phrase that gets used in this class and the linear algebra. You wouldn't think it would be possible for me to blank on it. Characteristic. Let's try that again. Better spelling this time. The characteristic polynomial. And if you then set it equal to zero, that's the characteristic equation. And you should be able to solve quadratic equations. We assume that of you, if not, um, Google the quadratic formula and take an hour or whatever to get it back into your memory. Because, as I say, we assume that we can solve these. So this always allows us to find at least one solution because this characteristic equation always has at least one solution. Now that solution might be complex, but that's fine. This is the first math class where we're going to actually in earnest use the imaginary unit and complex numbers and all that good stuff. So, there's always at least one solution. 
to create a general solution, we need two linearly independent solutions because this is a second order differential equation. And that's going to now throw us into the realm of cases. There are three possible cases we can be in. And I'll go, I guess, in order of niceness. It could be that the characteristic equation has two real roots. Call them R1, R2. In this case, you're golden. Because if R1 and R2 are different, e to the R1x and e to the R2x turn out to be linearly independent solutions. We can combine them using the superposition principle, and there's our general solution. So, for example, y double prime plus 3, y prime plus 2y equals 0. Real. It's a little awkward, or maybe students don't care and I'm just making it. Awkward. Ordinarily, if you're very, if you're, you've got a y double prime, then you think of x as being the variable of the differential equation. But the x of the characteristic polynomial is completely apart from the characteristic equation. Anyway, you can always solve a quadratic, but this particular quadratic and this particular example were lab grown so that you wouldn't have to spend a lot of time messing around with um, the quadratic form to the negative two and negative one are solution. And with two real solutions, we can create two solutions to the differential equation, and then we can combine them using the superposition principle. All right, so as far as solving when you have two roots, two distinct real roots, that's okay. I mean, it, it, it will, of course, require practice to get it down, but you find the roots. Once you have the roots, 
you can create solutions. And once you have two linearly independent solutions, you can combine them. Um, something I'd like to mention is that knowing what the roots are gives you a very strong idea of what this Y looks like. I mean, when I say it like that, it sounds facile. Knowing what the roots are, that's you write Y down. So of course that gives you a good idea of what Y looks like. You can go to Desmos and graph Y. But what I mean is that if you have two real roots, then simplifying a little, there are really only three cases you can be in. Maybe those roots are both positive. Then this is an exponential going to infinity. This is an exponential going to infinity. You're adding together two exponential functions going to infinity. So your graph looks something like that like an exponential function going to infinity. Maybe one of these is negative, but the other is positive. Well, as x increases, the exponential with the negative term goes to zero, but the other exponential still goes to infinity. So you've got something that looks like that. Finally, Maybe your roots are both negative. Then as X goes to infinity, both these terms go to zero. And our graph looks something like that. So at the moment, this is just a curiosity, but it's getting at something really fundamental about differential equations. And we're going to come back to this again and again throughout the course, that if we want to understand a differential equation, we often can get a very strong idea of how it behaves just based on whether a few numbers are positive or negative or some combination of those. I mean, Putting it in terms that we've already seen, zero is a fixed point. And this is controlling the stability of the fixed point. Here, the fixed point's unstable, so we go away from it. Here, the fixed point's unstable, so we go away from it. Here, the fixed point's asymptotically stable, and we converge to it. But plenty of time to discuss that later. Two cases remain. And the cases that remain are, there are two roots, but they're complex. And there's only one root, which is real. 
And I believe the textbook only actually looks at the complex case in this section, but we'll go ahead and do them both. Up to a point. The complex case is identical to the real case. So let me first start by reminding all of us that if there's a complex root, there are two complex roots. Like if, if two plus three i is a root, then two minus three i is also a root. So in the case where we have complex roots, they're complex conjugates of one another. And I say that up to a point, There is no difference between this case and the previous case. The addition gives us a solution subtraction gives us a solution. Those solutions are linearly independent, so we can use them to create a general solution. However, the point up to which this case and the last case are the same is this point that we have written on the board, and now we're going to move past it. You would not, in real world, real world, that's a weird use of phrase, you would not actually write your solution like that. And the reason you wouldn't is that we don't like those E's with imaginary terms in the exponent. I mean, I think it's probably fair to say that none of you have any intuition about what happens when you raise E to an imaginary number. So we'd like to get rid of this and see if we can write it in some way that doesn't have complex exponentials. And it turns out it is possible to do that. using Euler's form de la, which says that e to the i x equals the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to hit it with Euler's formula. So before we hit it with Euler's formula, we're going to break up both these exponentials. Um, remember that if you have addition or subtraction in an exponent, you can write that as a product, so y equals c1 e to the 2x e to the 3ix plus c2 e to the 2x 
B to the, this is gibberish because I did not write down the example we are doing. Um, let's not do an example. I mean, let's just say we're in this general case and we've got A and we've got B. So this two and this three, came from a specific example, but instead of a specific example, let's just work this out in generality. So we see both these terms have got an e to the ax in common. And now, well, let's go step by step, more haste to the speed. We pull that out. And we get that. And now we are going to um, hit e to the bix and e to the negative bix with Euler's formula. I mean, Euler's formula in the very natural way. If you put a b up there, it's going to put a B inside the sine and the cosine. We have E to the AX times C1 times the cosine of Bx plus i times the sine of Bx plus, let me not want to close the big parentheses. I want to close these small parentheses plus C2, the cosine of negative Bx plus I times the sine of negative Bx. So there we go. Um, maybe it doesn't look like a huge improvement. But by the time we're done, we really are going to get something that does not take the entire board to write. We are going somewhere nicer than this. The next step is a small one. We are not changing anything here. Cosine BX, I sine, Bx. All that remains the same. And all we're going to do on the right is we are going to use the fact that the cosine is even and the sine is odd and the cosine of a negative term 
is therefore the cosine of the positive term. And the sine of a negative term is negative the sine of the positive term. And now, what's going to happen? So let me try to, that e to the ax is out there. We're working inside these brackets. And inside these brackets, we see this cosine of bx show up twice and we see this side of bx show up twice. So on the next frame, I'm going to rearrange things. I'm going to combine those cosines and I'm going to combine those sines and get that y equals e to the ax times c1 plus c2 times the cosine of bx plus c1 minus c2 times i the sine of bx. And now this is a little fuzzy. But C1 plus C2 is a constant. And we're just, we're just going to give it a name. We're going to call it A. And C1 minus C2 is a constant, but the imaginary unit I is also a constant. So we're going to call that capital B. So capital A times the cosine of Bx plus capital B times the sine of Bx. And we can think of everything here as being real. And that might seem like kind of a cheat. You might say, well, but the imaginary unit's still there. You just hit it. You put it inside of the B. And the way to get around that is to think, OK, if we're working in the complex plane, then C1 can be complex and C2 can be complex. And if, for example, C1 is um, pure the imaginary or C2 or pure the imaginary, then C1 minus C2 times the imaginary unit would be a real. So even though you do have this imaginary unit here, this product can be a real. And we'll think of B, capital B, therefore, as being a real number. Um, 
and that's that's the process. This is um, much as I hate to. I mean, I don't. You can bring a note card or into tests or whatever. I don't really care about rote memorization. But this is. I mean, I would not recreate that whole process every time. I would not start from here and try to wind up here. I would just burn that uh, form to the, with the cosines and the sines. And again, this is kind of looking ahead. It's probably not in the textbook. But once again, you can understand this solution just by asking whether a few numbers are positive or negative. If A is positive, then e to the ax is going to go to infinity as x goes to infinity. The cosine and sine bounce around between negative 1 and 1. So what that's going to give us is a solution that looks like that. It's a wave, but as x increases, the amplitude of the wave increases. If A were negative, so now instead of infinity, this is going to zero. And that cosine and that sine are stuck bouncing between negative one and one. And you get kind of the opposite picture. Finally, in the event that A happens to be zero, and if A happens to be zero, then E to the AX is one. So you just have the cosine and the sine bouncing around. And you got uh, my, uh, my, my chaotic penmanship maybe makes that look like it's doing something it's not. You just have the cosine and the sine, and you get the standard wave graph. So it's looking ahead, but again, note that we can understand what this differential equation is doing just by looking at a specific number. And still looking ahead, in this particular case, it doesn't really matter. We can also understand what the differential equation is doing by solving it and plugging it into Desmos. But we're looking ahead to a time when we won't be able to solve the differential equations. However, although we won't be able to solve them, we'll still be able to do analysis like this. But crashing back to the present, we have some time, so let's look at what happens if we have a single real root R. 
Um, the textbook doesn't talk about this in this section, but it does talk about it. It just waits till another section to do so. Okay, well, when, when would this happen? When would you have a single root? Well, you'd have a single root if your characteristic polynomial factored in that way. A single root means your characteristic polynomial is a perfect square. Now, remember where your characteristic polynomial comes from. It comes from the differential equation. So your differential equation must be ay double prime minus 2ar y prime plus ar squared y equals zero. And I mean, you're not going to be able to glance at a differential equation and just know off the top of your head that it's in this form. Note, this relates back to something I said earlier, that we often assume that the number in front of the y double prime is zero is one, sorry. That's not an assumption here. We're just canceling the a's. We can divide both sides by a and get that differential equation. And the thing is, what do we need to find a general solution? Well, how do we create general solutions? The general solution is built out of other solutions using the superposition principle. And we have a solution where we can get a solution, um, one solution. What's the one solution that we can get in this phrase? just using material we've already covered today. The A plus or minus BI. So A plus or minus BI is going to happen, I mean, that stuff's for when you have two complex roots. Here we have a single real. Okay. But I mean, it's the right thought. Well, could you just use uh, 
the quadratic equation. Find the ax squared minus two arx plus ar squared. Right. You absolutely you um. So we have. So we have this differential equation. We get a quadratic equation from it, the characteristic polynomial. If there's only one root, we're calling it R, then the characteristic polynomial does factor that way. And I, I think maybe, I don't know if people are overthinking this a little, but we've, all, we've said earlier today that if R is a root, then E to the Rx is a solution. And the fact that R is a repeated root doesn't change that. So we still have, we still get a solution from that root, we get e to the rx. The issue is that to use the superposition principle, we then need a second solution. Previously, the second solution came from the second root. That was true when you had two real solutions. It was true when you had two complex solutions. But now there isn't a second root. So what can the second what could the other solution be? Well, similar to what we did when we started this class. And again, this is something textbooks say that drives me insane. We're going to guess that maybe the second root is a function times e to the rx. And again, I hate it when textbooks say this because it's, it's obscuring the logic behind it. We're not just flailing around at random. Why do we think that um, a function times e to the rx might be a root? Well, because we've already seen examples where a function times e to the rx is a root. Any constant function times, I keep saying root, I mean solution. Any constant function times e to the rx is going to be a solution. So we can find other solutions, but they're not linearly independent. They're not the solutions we need. So we can say we're guessing, but we're not flailing around at random here. We're saying, well, we've seen this situation where a function times e to the rx is a solution. So if we see it once, maybe we can see it a second time. Now, I said earlier that any time I, um, any time I say I'm going to wave my hands over the details, it means I'm about to give the details uh, exhaustively. Here, I really am going to wave my hands a bit, just because the calculus is so messy. Um, there's why. 
we need to know what y prime is to plug it into that. Y prime, though, requires the product rule. And then y double prime, um, and I, I have no idea what I thought I was writing there. I said the product rule, which was correct, but then wrote the most horrible gibberish. The product rule says take the derivative of u, leave the other function alone, then leave u alone and take the derivative of the other function. And then you need y double prime and you have to use the product rule again. Take the derivative of the first function, leave the second function alone. Now leave the first function alone, take the derivative of the second function, and now we have to use the product rule again. And when you take that y, and you take that y prime, and you take that y double prime, that horrible y double prime that has four different terms in it, and you plug them in to this equation. And here's where I'm going to wave my hands and say that when the dust settles, Almost everything has canceled itself out. And you get that for this to be a solution, the second derivative of u times e to the rx has to be a zero. The e to the rx cancels, or that is to say, we can divide both sides by e to the rx, and you get that this is a solution if and only if the second derivative of that function u is zero. And I, I won't try you too hard. The functions whose second derivatives are zero are the linear functions. I'll just remind you of that. So C2, plus C3x e to the rx is a solution for any C2 and any C3. By equals. So I'm being a little sloppy here. The superposition principle says, well, if this is a solution and we're using the superposition principle to combine it with other solutions, there ought to be a constant there. And what I'm saying is, okay, you can think of there being a constant there, 
But then you can think of that constant distributing inside. And then you can say, well, if D and C2 are arbitrary constants, then D times C2 is an arbitrary constant. And D times C3 is an arbitrary constant. And we can write our solution like this. And this simplifies a little um, because we have C1 e to the Rx. And then when we distribute, we'll have C2 e to the Rx. And we can combine those terms and wind up with, we've used these Cs so much, that's say D1 e to the Rx plus D2 times X times e to the Rx. So, that's all of the possible cases. Every quadratic can have one real root, two real roots, or two um, complex conjugate roots. And we've run through the cases, and we've seen in each of these cases how we can solve the differential equation. That brings us rather neatly to the end of this section. So we'll also say that it brings us to the end of this class.